Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, uh, especially since Peter Diamandis uh, was one of the very early people that committed to our company and was really part of that view that moonshots can really become a reality today. So I'd like to just bring you up to speed in terms of where we are with the development of a company, which is just three years old. And when I think of exponential thinking and the progress that's possible today with the tools we've all been granted in this world of transportation, which is in so, so sorely in need of disruption, uh, I think you'll see some very encouraging signs. So let's start with transportation. We know what we have is not working today, and we know it's getting worse. Our experience on the roads in traffic is soul crushing. Our experience at airports is often demeaning. Our ports are clogged, congested, and making traffic worse and contributing to emissions. So it's not difficult for me to establish when I have a drink with neighbors why we need something different because what we have today isn't working. So our company's mission is to actually reinvent transportation by eliminating the barriers of distance and time, by impacting what we can do when we move quickly or move differently between different locations, both cargo and freight. And actually, after 21 years at Cisco, it was so obvious to me that there needs to be a new high-speed backbone to connect some of the innovations we've heard about this morning and provide an ability to move longer distances at extremely high speeds in a much different way than we are today. So Hyperloop, um, everyone feel really comfortable they can do the Hyperloop uh, elevator pitch? Okay, I'll do a short one and then I'll put an expert behind the longer one. So it's a couple of basic concepts. You have a pod, think of that as a vehicle that can carry either cargo or passengers. And those would be different vehicles optimized uh, for each of those transportation use cases. You remove the pressure from an enclosed area. The area that we're demonstrating right now is a tube. When you remove the pressure, you reduce a lot of the resistance that an object faces when it moves forward. And any of the cars we drive in, I have a beautiful Tesla. At some speed, it's air pressure that starts to give you that squirrely feeling. It starts to say, I think I'm going as fast as I feel comfortable going. So when you remove the air pressure, you remove resistance. We have an all electric motor. Uh, a linear electric motor that's used for propulsion. Uh, in this case, it's in the track, uh, it's inside the tube, and the actual pod is passive. Uh, you have passive magnetic levitation, which actually lifts the vehicle off uh, a conductive track. It makes no sound, it, it has very little resistance, it has no wheels, and then finally you have a control system, very similar to some of the automated systems that we just heard about, uh, that will allow us to move these vehicles in very close proximity, something like truck platooning on a highway, but have very high throughput, very rapid uh, loading of either containers, cargo, or passengers inside of this closed environment. Remember, there's no one throwing a sofa off a, coat, uh, off a bridge onto a railroad track. We don't have ice, we don't have storms, we don't have any environmental interruptions. You have a closed, very closed environment. So I put together a little video that I call Hyperloop 101 that explains this in some detail, and why don't we take a look? Imagine traveling non-stop at up to 670 miles per hour, above land or underground. This is Hyperloop, a new mode of transportation that has been developed by Hyperloop One. It starts with an electric motor, which is broken up into two basic components, the rotor, which rotates, and the stator, which is stationary. The stator is an electromagnet, so when an electric current passes through it, the rotor is magnetically attracted to spin. Unlike a normal electric motor, the Hyperloop 1 motor isn't circular, it's linear. And the rotor is on the pod, which is propelled magnetically as it moves over the stator. Hyperloop 1's unique technology uses magnetic levitation to guide and lift the pod off the track. Nearly all of the air inside the Hyperloop tube is removed using a series of vacuum pumps. This effectively creates our own sky inside the tube, as if you are quietly flying at 200,000 feet above sea level. This reduces drag so only the smallest amount of electricity is needed to achieve extraordinary speeds and creates a more cost and energy efficient system than high-speed rail or airline transport. 
Hyperloop One will be automated by the most advanced systems in the world, allowing a safe and efficient journey that's never delayed or overbooked. Hyperloop is the first new form of public transportation in over 100 years. Fundamentally, it will change the way we travel, work and live. Welcome to the future. Welcome to Hyperloop One. So I call that the Hyperloop 101. And uh, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just talking about what are we going to do with this? What impact will this have? Why do we need something uh, so dramatic and so different? First and foremost, when you think of transportation today, we generally, or mass transportation, we generally think of schedules. So I had to catch a flight last night from LA to here. It was nine o'clock. I knew I had to catch an Uber by exit. It's all schedules. So this transportation mode, because we'll be moving smaller numbers of any unit, not 600 uh, people in a train, but maybe 30 or 40 in a pod is on demand. You arrive and you leave uh, at the same time. No schedules. Uh, it's point to point. What's the problem with many modes of transport? I have a place in Santa Monica and it goes very close to our office in downtown LA, but it stops and 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 it takes an hour and a half and I go, I'll take an Uber. So I don't use that mode because it's always stopping. Hyperloop will be point to point, switching on and off a main track as we switch on and off a freeway, but point to point significantly changes the time that it will take us to actually reach a destination. Um, it's really important for us to remember that existing modes of transportation are the hubs of today's infrastructure. So we're seeing in many of the use cases we're developing today and working on with governments around the world that it is important to connect an airport. It is important to come in and in a, in a different way connect to a major uh, rail center that's in many European and US uh, city centers. It is important to connect to the existing downtown centers where people want to live and work, yet at the same time, it's becoming so expensive to live in today's cities that we're pricing certain people out of the market. And imagine what it would feel like if you could live 150 miles away and still enjoy a job in San Francisco. Because my bone-crushing experience this morning from Los Gatos was demoralizing, frightening, and I didn't know whether I would be here or not. And of course, I got here so early that it's, uh, it, it's just not what we want anymore. We want a more predictable way in which we can balance job opportunities, opportunities to participate in any industry and company, yet not have to move into the most expensive city centers that are developing around the world. By the way, it's a suite of solutions. There's not one Hyperloop. The one we all get excited about is the one that's gonna see us in a pod going 1,000 kilometers an hour and ripping through some destination. But no, it's about sea containers which would be a slightly different problem to solve. It's all about throughput, very rapidly moving containers away from our ports and not using the world's most valuable land in city centers to store steel cans. Maybe you can do that 150 miles inland in a dry port and then do the logistics and redistribution of those products. It's also about passengers, but those passenger pods that we imagine uh, when we think of Hyperloop should also carry packages and cargo and light containerized freight. And then what about connecting factories and supply chains and an on-demand environment uh, of Alibaba or of Amazon with smaller package-based Hyperloops? And I really see one running down the 280 and taking as much as that traffic off of our current constrained uh, highways that are actually moving packages today. All three of those would be in the roadmap of what we're doing. I actually think that this is so important. And I've learned a lot moving from the networking industry into the transportation industry, that 30 minutes is a very special time. 30 minutes is the time that we felt comfortable in the agrarian era of how, lo how long we'd be happy to walk to a farm and walk home after a hard day's work. 30 days became the time that it was comfortable to ride a bicycle to a factory as we went through the industrial revolution. 30 days is what I felt and I think my dad felt was comfortable to drive his car from the suburbs to his job and, or 30 hours, 30, 30 minutes, if I'm saying days, it's 30 minutes, it's 30 days today. 30 minutes and now we could actually rechange the meaning as to what it means to live in a city by making 30 minutes many multiple cities, regional cities. So the idea of a city transforms into something quite different than we think of today. Um, and actually, 
it is 30 minutes when we sort of feel comfortable that that's our commute or that's the time it takes for us to get to work. It's kind of the one that doesn't sap your energy and make you feel depressed when you, uh, something goes wrong or you're trying to make a commitment at home. So remember 30 minutes because in 30 minutes you can connect tens and tens and tens of millions of people in this country and in countries around the world and completely redefine the cost of living for people to actually enjoy job opportunities anywhere. And I think that's a really big deal. Think of the, also the impact of having something that is going to facilitate this constant flow of demand for something now, whether it's inventory, very rapid manufacturing. I, you know, I, I have seen at some of these events the idea of manufacturing 3D uh, uh, outsourcing centers and being able to move my product very quickly to a logistics center. It's this on-demand personalized environment. So we can see a lot of change in supply chain, a lot of change in manufacturing as we all move to just-in-time manufacturing in kind of a, a shared environment, uh, reducing lead times, simplifying logistics, obviously uh, reducing distribution, the amount of inventory that's in the supply chain. We did a little study with a, a well-known consulting firm and you can take $10 billion out of a supply chain in just a regional hub. Uh, because you're, we will take trillions out of the combined supply chain around the world if you create a more efficient logistic system than we have today. The ports in uh, the container sitting outside of Los Angeles and Long Beach, they're days and sometimes weeks just to get into the port and then days and weeks to handle that product and then three to five days to get from Los Angeles to Chicago on a train. So if we can reduce that, it reduces significantly the costs in the global supply chain. You know, when I started with Hyperloop, it was two years ago, and I was sort of by d d default the chief sales guy. Um, we also hired one other person in London uh, who had been in the transportation business. And since Peter Diamandis was on our board, one of the first ideas we came up with was, why don't we run a contest for where the best ideas are for Hyperloop? Why don't we enlist the community around the world that's as equally frustrated by the backlog of of problems that are to be solved in transportation. So a year ago, we launched the Hyperloop One Global Challenge. We had an open source uh, 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 framework. We had Peter was, was advocating for us and doing videos, and, and we had 2,300 entrants. We looked at those entrants. We didn't have any idea what we would get out of this process. We really didn't know. But what we got back were phenomenal ideas of problems to be solved around the world a pipeline approaching $34 billion of projects, which isn't a bad thing to build without a sales force, um, and, and deep engagement with state and national governments that were advocating, build a Hyperloop here. We have real challenges, and we can see the impact that you can bring by being the first Hyperloop in a region, and the advantages we'd bring to our economy and the ecosystem of application developers and others that could innovate on top of this platform. It's been fascinating. We didn't think the US would be a ripe uh, opportunity. There's eight active projects right now that start short and get longer as part of a much broader network. And dozens in Europe and India has, has just come alive with the opportunities. So I really, really am excited about what we saw in terms of open sourcing this idea and bringing a community, including governments, engineering firms, universities, and people that just cared to bring together their ideas. We're going to announce actually in, a, in just 10 days who the winners are, and those winners we hope will continue to develop those projects with increasing level of specificity uh, that can turn into the first Hyperloops in the world. The impact on this, where we have spent a lot of time is obviously in the Middle East. There isn't rail infrastructure generally in the Middle East. There is a, a reputation for going first and doing spectacular things in Dubai and in the United Arab Emirates. But if you have been to the United Arab Emirates uh, and you have seen this fantastic highway they built between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, it's, and you go really fast, you drive almost as fast as you really feel comfortable driving, it's kind of an hour and a half to two hour drive now and we can turn that into 12 minutes. It, 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 it's, it's these distances. Look at the distances between these major cities. That is the, the GCC. 
and there'd be nothing more than, than an hour apart anywhere in the GCC between two cities, between Riyadh and Mecca, between Doha in Qatar and in Abu Dhabi is 17 minutes. These are transformational impacts on a region that is shifting from their dependency on a petrol economy to wanting to build a manufacturing economy and infrastructure and transportation is part of doing that. And then let's take a look at the United States where I wasn't as optimistic, I wasn't as enthusiastic. I thought this is gonna happen somewhere else where people care about public transportation, where, where governments are part of solving that problem. But when you could cover 80% of the US population and the vast majority of goods movement aligning with existing right of ways that are in place in this country from building the rail and highway system over the decades that have gone before us, but which have not been maintained at the level that they need to be. And why don't we, instead of you know, making a faster high-speed rail, why don't we leapfrog that and have something three times more efficient, much faster, made in the United States, and actually requiring a much smaller footprint than any rail system needs today. And so anywhere in the US in five hours. And, and you know, the LA, San Francisco thing, it gets the one that Elon Musk, that got him to, to, to uh, open source this whole idea. Uh, I tell you, if you look at that, at that Dallas and Texas corridor, if you look at what's happening in the Northeast, this is a huge opportunity for this country. By the way, we're not going to start off by building a 1,700-mile hyperloop. We'll start off with the first link in a major hub between here and here, and then continue that in building out a global network. That vision could be built in 20 years. That vision would provide, potentially, for this country, the most modern infrastructure for the movement of goods and people in the world. So all sounds cool. It's a bit of a moonshot. And is it really happening? And actually, I was and I have continued to be, be struck by not only the smartness of the 280 people that, that have joined this team, PhDs and masters of engineering from multiple disciplines from around the world. We have a really cool place in downtown LA that was like literally when I showed up, the taxi driver wouldn't take me to the end of the street in the art district because he was afraid that you know, bad things would happen. And it is now part of a massively growing part of downtown Los Angeles. People from companies, including the ones we just heard uh, on the, uh, with the, with, uh, the previous speaker. Um, uh, a track record of delivering against engineering milestones. 2015, when I joined, was the year of validating the physics and engineering. We built systems to test and validate. 2016 was the year of testing the components. You saw that sand spray up on that open air test. That was testing the linear electric motor. There's been other specific tests of components. And 2017 has been the year of validating that the Hyperloop architecture and the way in which we've implemented it actually works. And now we're moving from what we announced two or three weeks ago, with the fact that this technology works, it's delivering, it moves really quickly. Uh, we're actually going to go to the next step. Uh, uh, an innovation campus in Los Angeles, 75,000 square feet, five acres, around 200 people, really some of the coolest, smartest people. I just feel smart by just standing around them and, 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 and they're just so committed to making this happen. A 100,000 square foot manufacturing facility in North Las Vegas so we could manufacture and build the IP to actually scale this around the world. Uh, a development site, and that's a picture uh, of something that we've built on a Bureau of Land Management, a transportation corridor in, the, in nor North Las Vegas in an apex industrial park. Uh, that's a 500 meter, 200 ton uh, steel tube on concrete pylons, a uh, uh, Nevada State uh, substation just out of range uh, at the bottom of that picture. And everything you see in that picture was built in 10 months. And it's a full Hyperloop system. And, and usually it takes us 10 months to have a meeting with a government official and get someone to set up the, the meeting notes, right? And this is absolutely possible. And oh, by the way, the state of Nevada was all over this and they got things to happen and they made things happen. And when governments get behind a big idea, they can happen. 
And it isn't that they're just their view is their general posture is we should be obstructionist. But when a state government or a national government really wants this to happen, it will happen. And we've proved that in Las Vegas. Just a couple of weeks ago, we rolled out the idea of our first pod. It was kind of for us pretty exciting. It's a, it's a carbon fiber uh, and aluminum structure that actually sits on top of what you'd think of almost as equivalent to a Formula One race chassis. And we demonstrated to the world that this team could deliver and build the proof of concept that Hyperloop actually works. So if it's okay, I'm gonna end by just showing you what makes me very proud to be part of a group of people that have done something in 10 months and everything you'll see in the next one minute occurred in 10 months and I think absolutely proves that exponential thinking is alive and kicking uh, all over the world. So let's take a look. All right, all parties ready for tests? Five, four, three, two, one, fire. And the next big news for our company is where will we build the first Hyperloop anywhere in the world? I hope to have an answer in the next three months. Thank you very much. Thank you.